You know, we talk, the main points here that we're going to focus on U.S. role in Latin America and grassroots solidarity activism. Uh, and it's weird seeing these clips from the 1980s and the Contra War. It seems like yesterday that this stuff was happening. And, it, and, and maybe we can reflect on this here, is that back then we didn't have the YouTubes and we didn't have the My Faces and, my, and Space Books and all these other spaces where we exchange ideas. We didn't have you know, the, multi, the, the micro cameras and, and the ability to edit in our bathrooms while you know, we're taking a shower. And we didn't have all those technologies. Uh, and, and in fact, you could even see aesthetically how they evolved over the years, right? How now you see some of the videos coming out and they're so technically, you know, beautiful, uh, but, the, but the message is still the same, right? And the spirit of the people producing it, and of resistance, of, of solidarity, is still the same. And so I think that's something that we could reflect on and see, you know, where we are now with all this uh, extensive media that we have accessible to us now, does it change the equation? Does it change the dynamics of the kind of work that we're trying to do as scholars, as historians, as activists, as videographers, uh, uh, and, and, and filmmakers? And I think that's one of the things that we're going to try to discuss today. Um, the other thing is, have things really changed? Right? Roy Bourgeois, the, the founder of uh, School of the Americas, was on my program on Friday. We had a nice discussion about some of the work that they've been doing and some of the uh, logros, some of the achievements that the School of the Americas Watch has been able to do uh, in terms of building a, a massive movement over the last 18 years to close down the School of the Americas. And he commented on how things have changed in Latin America and that finally people are, are now the, with the governments, the new, some of the new governments in power and, and the social movements. We we see Evo Morales in Bolivia. We see what happened in El Salvador, and, and Phil is going to talk about that. We see uh, you know, a whole slew of, uh, of positive, progressive movement uh, throughout the hemisphere. Uh, Roy said that now the people are saying, basta ya, yeah, we're not going to allow US you know, power and, and influence to control our lives and dictate the way we live. And I said, yes, that's certainly true to a certain extent. But on the other hand, the regressive, rep rep repressive, regressive, reactionary forces are still there in all those countries. And, and, and in fact, it's playing a, a, a role in destabilizing, in many respects, those regimes. And so what role do we play as solidarity media activists to try to make sure that, that, that uh, certain things don't uh, turn around? You know, in watching... Um in watching those documentaries, I was thinking about a few years ago when, when the term the Salvador and the Salvador option came back into the news and having to do specifically with the prescription for how to respond to the to Iraq careening out of control. A lot of foreign policy analysts and counterinsurgent theorists and public policy uh, intellectuals started talking about the success in El Salvador as a model for how to apply to Iraq. And you know, those who paid attention and certainly lived through some of the history that we watched tonight. Uh, understood exactly what that meant, that it meant the application of death squads, the application of a heavy hand, the giving up of any kind of the supposed idealist uh, attempt to bring democracy and the return to, to an open embrace of paramilitarism or death squads or, um, or armed, or armed uh, strongmen in order to enforce imperial, uh, imperial order on Iraq. But over the last couple of years, I've started to think that there's a, there's a, there's a the, the, the Salvador option speaks to something a little bit more than just the use of uh, the turn towards local proxies uh, to, to execute death squad killings. Uh, I, I think of the Salvador option as a, as a certain kind of imperial amnesia, the refusal to to consider how in U.S. intervention in the first place creates the violence and creates the the conflict and crisis that 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 more intervention is often prescribed as the solution for and and again Salvador is the perfect example of this not just in the 1980s but earlier in the 19 in, in the early 1960s Central America more broadly in Salvador and in, in particular after the Cuban Revolution became one of the first places where the United States put into place and strengthened a local intelligence system within the countryside and the local uh, paramilitary military network that that by by re responding to all sorts all attempts at local agrarian reform and and rural organizing with violence and with terror and basically becoming the constabulary of the of the of the landed class actually eventually summoned into being the insurgency that justified the counterinsurgency in the first place counterinsurgency preceded the insurgency in El Salvador as as it did in many other places in, in Latin America yeah, um, 
As Mario said, uh, I uh, about uh, a week and a half ago, I got back from El Salvador where uh, I was part of a delegation of uh, people from CISPIS, the Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador, and we uh, were international observers uh, for the really what turned out to be the historic uh, presidential elections of March 15th. Um, to understand just how earth-shaking in some ways this is for, for El Salvador, I mean, uh, my friend uh, Roberto Lobato was, was down there and he was interviewing a woman in Izalco, uh, which is uh, the site of the 1932 massacre of indigenous people. Uh, where the military just came in and wiped out 30,000 people uh, and buried them in this spot in Izalco. Uh, and he asked uh, a woman in the community who was, you know, they were standing in front of this field where all these people were buried. And the FMLN had just won Izalco uh, in in the elections, uh, and he's he asked her. He said, "So, what do you think? What do you think finally did it?" And she said, "Well, it's our dead. All the people who died. You know, the thirty thousand that died in '32, the seventy thousand that died in the Civil War." Uh, all fighting for uh, economic justice and for a right to live in a, in a democratic society. I will, I'm always curious about the audiences that I speak to. Every time I go to a place, I watch and I pay attention because since I was as I was little in Colombia, I I was scared and. Going back to your question, Mario, uh, what do I think about the images that I saw? I shot a documentary with the Salvadorian uh, community in Boston, refugees and, and immigrants like me. And uh, although I didn't experience war firsthand, I feel that most people in the planet, but specifically in Colombia, are traumatized, especially when we're poor. I believe that war has affected every sector of society, including the United States. And as a result, um, it is important to do something about it. There are different ways that people deal with these issues. Some people take Prozac, <laughs> other people shoot up. Now, when we have a situation where people are not centered because the structure of capitalism in which we live, um, dehumanizes all of us, and everything that I'm saying is, is have been said by many people, although I don't think with this accent. Now, that's what is important. That's what is important. That will tell you that things are beginning to change. I like to basically uh, use the minutes that I have to tell you that documentary is an important medium. That after the Lumiere brothers invented the moving picture, in the 1800, the world changed radically. For the most part, the conflict in Colombia has been happening in, in pretty much in isolation because the attention to Colombia has been minimal um, throughout the years. There, we, we in, the, in Colombia, the Colombia Media Project, which was the group that we had, um, worked for 10 years and we were uh, producing a number of videos and we were um, organizing conferences and newsletters and brochures and distributing media from Colombia and we managed to get a little bit of attention by the I guess the end of the 90s the beginning of the the 2000 and then September 11 came and forget it Colombia was erased from um, from the public um, from the public basically and and so now uh, people are told things are much better in Colombia now, and we have, I don't know how many years of Plan Colombia, and there are not so many killings as before. And it's true in a way, because uh, 
I'll, I can give you some numbers. Uh, during the 90s, mid-90s to late, um, to early 2000, um, there were massacres, a lot of massacres perpetrated, mostly uh, by the uh, right-wing paramilitaries, um, also uh, massacres committed by the FARC. And uh, we had about uh, an average of 10 people killed a day. Uh, nowadays, we have, I, I was looking at the figure, and it, we have uh, an average of four people killed a day. So that's a lot less people, but hello, still four people a day. 